while we've known a lot about solids and I, while we've known a lot about liquids and, and gases because of, of early experiments in chemistry, the gas laws and all that stuff, solids and the structures of solids is relatively new. So everything that we've learned about crystals and solids have really come through a technique called X-ray diffraction. And this is actually something that was really, uh, that began in earnest at the turn of the 20th century, so the early 1900s. And so X-ray diffraction is the scattering of X-rays by the units of the crystalline solids. Uh, let me rewrite that, just a I N E. All right, crystalline, so this is the scattering of x-rays by the units of the crystalline solids. And so what happens is that the scattering patterns are produced or used to deduce the arrangement of particles in the solid lattice. Let me show you how this works. So you've got an x-ray tube that's going to generate x-rays. Okay, so you got this x-ray tube that we turn on, we generate x-rays, and what we do is take those x-rays and concentrate those beams so, through using a slit. Okay, so we get one very strong x-ray beam, and then we shine that beam directly through a crystal. So what we pick out a crystal, like think of it this way, you're taking a crystal of sugar or a crystal of salt. So you just need one crystal right here that's sitting through that, sitting right there. Now what we do then is that once this x-ray gets shined into the crystal, what we happen to see is that every time it goes through the crystal, it goes through this, the x-rays go through the crystal, it begins to show us some of those lattice points. Okay, so what we also do is also put a shield in the middle so that because most of the concentration of the beams are going to go right into the middle. So that's why we have that shield right there. But what we're looking at, we're looking at the positions. We're looking at these the arrangement of these particles inside that crystal. And so this technique, if you guys ever re, uh, have ever seen the, the photograph 51 that uh, Rosalind Franklin used to figure out the structure of DNA, this is pretty much the same technique that she used. Instead of using a crystal, like a really, like a solid, she actually took a really fine thread of DNA and put it right here and then shine that light through shine the x-ray beam right through the dna th strand okay so uh in 1912 max von Laue suggested that because the wavelength of x-rays is comparable in magnitude to the distances between lattice points in a crystal the lattice should be able to scatter x-rays and so we have this figure right here so let's say you've got two rays you've got well, let's deal with one ray at a time so we got we've got the first ray and i've drawn that arrow right next to the way that we're going to talk we're going to show this so you've got this x way x ray that's being shown in red it hits a certain it hit one that that x ray is traveling in the light beam okay that light hits point lattice point a okay and when it hits lattice point a that ray is reflected. Okay, so lay, the the light's coming in. Woo, 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 fun, fun times. That light hits point A, and then that light is reflected off. Okay, so if we go down to the next level, same deal. We've got X-ray coming through, traveling on a beam, but now that beam has to go a little bit further than what it did to travel that what it did for that first wave so think of it this way so it looks like everything is in sync until we get to the point b okay 
everything's in sync until that point. And then if we take a look at that reflected ray, it's back in sync with point D. So you've got a line segment here, BC and CD, that is not in sync. Okay, so both rays are in sync until ray one, the first ray, hits point A. And at that point, when that first ray hits point A, that's when that second ray is at point B. Okay, so both rays are in sync until ray number one hits point A. Okay. Now that second ray has a little bit of distance that it has to travel. And that and for us that's gonna be line segment BC and then line segment B uh, C D in order to sync up again. Okay, so there's an extra distance that the second ray has to travel in order to fa be in phase with the reflected ray again. And we said that that's line segment BC and then line segment CD. Okay, now if we were to take a look at line segment BC and we were to measure the angle between, you know, that if we were to set this up as a triangle, so let's say we draw a line between, we make a line between a, point A and point C, we could use trigonometry and we can figure out that that angle, that, that line segment for BC should be the distance between points A and C, which we're going to call lowercase d, times the sine of that, th of that angle, okay? So you're, and then for CD, we're going to do it the same way. So you're going to have the same distance. Okay, so what we're going to say is that line segment BC and line segment CD, this is equal to 2 times the distance between the two lattice points times sine theta. And again, D, that lowercase d, this is the distance between point A and point C line segment CAC, if you want to call it that. All right, so to help us figure out that distance, what D is, okay, we say, if we use this equation that BC, line segment BC, plus line segment CD is equal to 2D sine theta, well, that 2D sine theta, 2 times D times sine theta, this is going to be equal to the wavelength of the x-ray times n, which is the layer level. Okay, so we've got I we've got some uh, some variables here. So let's let's figure this out. So d is going to be the distance between the adjacent planes. Okay, n. We call that the layer level. And this has to be an integer. So it's got to be 1, 2, 3, so on. OK. And then at, uh, lambda, the Greek symbol lambda, this is going to be your wavelength. OK. And then theta. Theta is going to be the angle between the rays. So this equation, and I'm going to box it up, okay? So this equation, this is called the Bragg equation. Okay, so let's try this out. So we got a problem here. X-rays of wavelength 0 0.154 nanometers are diffracted from a crystal at an angle of 14.17 degrees. Assuming n equals 1, 
Okay. Calculate the distance in picometers between the layers in a crystal. All right. So what information do we have? So we know that the wavelength is 0 0.154 nanometers. And we know that theta, the angle, is going to be 14.17 degrees. Okay. We also know that N, the layer level, is going to be 1. All right, so if we look at the Bragg equation, we've got wavelength, we've got n, we've got theta. So the only thing that we have to solve for is d, the distance. Okay, so that being said, we know those letters. Let's see what we got. So here is the wave equation again, or the Bragg equation, 2d sine theta is equal to n times lambda. Okay, we're solving for d. So in order for this equation to work, I need to get D by itself. And so for that to, to get D by itself, I'm going to take 2. I'm going to divide both sides by 2 sine theta. So that way, we're left with D on the left-hand side. OK. All right, so we've got those pieces. All right, now one thing that we should do before we get carried away, we have a wavelength that's in nanometers, it's asking for picometers. We probably should do that, that conversion right now before we go, go any further. So if the, lamb, if the wavelength is 0 0.154 nanometers, that means that there is, there are 10 to the third picometers in one nanometer. Okay, so nanometer is 10 to the minus 9th meters, picometer is 10 to the minus 12th uh, meters. All right, so uh, 0.154 times 10 to the third, that gives us 154 picometers. So that one's easy. All right, all right, so now that we have the right lambda, we have theta, we have n, before, and one more thing, before we do anything else, Notice that the theta is given to you in degrees. So if you're using a scientific or a graphing calculator, change that from radians to degrees. Okay. All right. So now let's pop it in. So our equation is D is equal to N times lambda divided by 2 sine theta. So let's pop it in. We know N is going to be 1. Lambda, we just figured out, is 154 picometers divided by 2 times sine of 14.17 degrees. Okay. So if we take 1 times 154, that's 154, times 2 times sine of 1417, that D should be 314.54 picometers. Now, if we're reporting this with the right amount of sig figs, that number should be 315 picometers. And that's it. That is the Bragg equation. Okay, one more topic before we call it for liquids and solids. And that is to talk about the types of crystals that we have. So we talked about that we have two to, that we classify solids as to two as to you know we put everything in two categories either they're crystalline solids or they're amorphous solids. So let's talk about other types of crystals that we have. So there's actually four main types of crystals. So you can have an ionic crystal, and these crystals are are really determined by the kinds of intermolecular forces that holds the particles together. So you have an ionic crystal. Ionic crystals have two important characteristics that they're composed of charged species. So you're going to have a positively charged species next to a negatively charged species. And the anions and the cations are going to be quite different in size. Okay. So usually one is going to be smaller. Usually the cation is going to be a lot smaller than the anion. Now we also know that ionic crystals will have very high melting and boiling points. Okay, and we actually saw that back in Gen Chem 1 when we talked about lattice energy. Okay. 
Okay. Now, also, ionic crystals do not conduct electricity. Okay, so solids do not conduct electricity. However, if an ionic crystal is in the molten state, that does. So molten state, you've melted that crystal down, so it kind of free flows. It's not quite a liquid yet. So if you've melted some, uh, melted an ionic crystal down to that point where it's kind of like glass, uh, yes, that that does conduct electricity. You also have covalent. So you do have covalent crystals. Now the atoms here are going to be held together by covalent bonds and what we notice is that as the, we look at the stronger the covalent bond the hardness increases so in, when we're talking about hardness here we're talking about how malleable is a solid so what we want to look at the stronger the covalent bond we want to look at really we want to deal with low difference in electronegativities, okay? So think of it this way. If you take a look at a diamond, diamond is supposed to be one of the strongest materials on Earth. So if you think of a carbon bonded to a carbon, those carbons are pretty, I mean, the difference in electronegativity is virtually zero, okay? So we want to deal with, really, in a covalent crystal, We really the strongest covalent crystals are going to be Nonpolar covalent bonds. Okay, and two examples diamond, which are sp3 hybridized carbons, and then graphite, which is sp2 hybridized carbons as well. So, sp3, so think of it this way diamond, they're the strongest material ever. Graphite, you can break that. We all, we all have broken pencils at, at some point in our lives, and that's, that's what's inside a pencil. So just by changing the type of carbon, going from sp3 to sp2, you know, now we got a double bond that weakens it a little bit. There you go. All right, so you do have that. Uh, another type of crystal is called a molecular crystal. And so with a molecular crystal, each lattice point of a molecule is going to be a molecule instead of an atom. So what we tend to see here is that the attractive forces that what the, what's going to hold atoms in place are van der Waals forces like dipole-dipole interactions and London dispersion, okay, and or hydrogen bonding. And you know what we saw when we talked about intermolecular forces: the weaker the forces, the weaker the crystals. and that these tend to be easily broken. Okay. So the lower, the, the weaker the forces, the weaker the crystals, easily broken. And then finally, the last type of crystal that we have are metallic crystals. Where every lattice point in the crystal is going to be occupied by a metal atom. These are usually pretty dense crystals and they are also great conductors of heat and electricity.